I know many of you already know Refed, but just wanted to say welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and take a moment to introduce ourselves in case you're not familiar. Um, Refed works to motivate and mobilize the multiple stakeholders in the food system to advance solutions to food waste. Um, with our kind of 50,000 level foot view of the food system, we serve as a catalyst promoting solutions driven action, a connector trying to facilitate collaborations and partnerships, partnerships between all of the stakeholders um, within the food system. And then as well, we serve as a source of data and insights as, and best practices on the issue of reducing food loss and waste. Um, our hope is to do all three of those things today with you during the discussion and throughout this whole series. And um, just thank you for listening in. We hope you get a lot out of it. All right, back to you, Jackie. Thanks, Dana. Um, great. Well, very excited for this week's installment as we have been learning so much uh, from the experts and panelists that we've had on the call the last few weeks. Today, we're going to be focusing on the topic of government. Uh, and all of the activity that's really been happening from the federal, state, and local level, including legislation to provide organizations with support during the pandemic. Uh, and we're going to be learning from our panelists today about that support, how to access that support, and how to engage with different levels of government and what additional resources are available. So really relevant, I think, for the times and hopefully for those that have joined today. Uh, Nathan, if I can ask you to pull up the poll. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd love to get a better view of who is on the call today. If you can take just a second to respond um, with the sector that best describes your organization. That should be popping up right about now on your screen. Great, a pretty, a pretty good mix as always. Um, thank you for taking a minute to do that. We can take it down. Wonderful. Well, that just gives us a better perspective of, of who's on the call today and for our, our panelists as well to know who they are speaking to. Um, so with that, let me introduce our panelists for today. And before I turn some time over to them to kind of give some opening comments before we open up for questions. So first we have Emily Broadley who's director of the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic. Uh, as founder of the clinic, Emily launched the first law school clinic in the nation devoted to providing clients with legal and policy solutions to address the health, economic, and environmental challenges facing our food system. And she'll be giving us a bit of an overview of the policy landscape on the call today. We also have Tom O'Donnell, sustainability coordinator with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, NAHI Region 3. Uh, Tom, a geologist, environmental scientist, entrepreneur, and teacher, is a sustainability coordinator in the, the Sustainable Management of Food Program. He's also the primary architect of the urban soup, surplus food recovery model. And last but certainly not least, we have Elizabeth Balkin, the director of food waste in the Food and Agriculture Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, Elizabeth helps to catalyze and scale food waste reduction from businesses and consumers at the local and national levels. She's worked extensively with cities to make sustainable development economically viable in the developed and developing context. So she'll be providing a lot more of that local context and perspective on the call today. Um, so just a quick reminder for all of our participants, our goal within this, the hour that we have together is really to be sharing best practices and supporting each other during this time. So as you're asking questions or providing your own best practices later, just ask you to keep that in mind as our primary goal as a, as a group today. So with that, um, I'd love to turn it over to our panelists, and we're going to go ahead and go in the order that I just read introductions. And just a couple questions to guide your comments over the next few minutes. Um, I'd love to hear what the government is doing to be reducing food waste and increase food security during the COVID-19 crisis, as well as what organizations can be doing to make the most of that support and working with government at different levels. Um, a quick reminder before Emily, I turn it over to you just for all the participants is again, please use that chat function at any point now during the rest of the call to share your questions for the panelists, as well as any experiences that you'd be interested in sharing with the group. And with that, Emily, it is all you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and so good to see everyone either on video or names up on the in the participant list that we've worked with for some time. 
Um, I'm really grateful to Refed for putting this together um, and excited to share, but really to also, you know, have some dialogue here, some questions and, and about best practices. Um, so I said I would kind of kick off with a little bit of what we're seeing in the policy landscape at the um, kind of macro scale. Um, and I know just, I don't want to take up too much time, but I thought I would share a little bit of some of the big picture changes. It's been um, somewhat of a shifting landscape. And I think the good news is that we're seeing a lot of response on the part of government to really um, find ways to support the food system during this crisis. Um, so I think there's really, from my perspective, two main reasons that we're seeing food be wasted right now. One is because there's a whole part of the supply chain that's down, and that is food that would be going into the hospitality sector, the commercial sector. So, you know, restaurants, hotels, um, you know, concert venues, uh, universities, that's all down. So we're trying to find ways to both support farmers and producers in that chain and get that food to not be wasted. And then on the flip side, we also have food, we always have food that's wasted. Um, you know, Refed's done amazing work showing us where that is. And what we're seeing is that there's new challenges with um, getting other surplus food that would have been wasted in normal times, um, just in terms of a reduced number of volunteers, um, you know, overwhelming of the system in terms of the need and also challenges of trying to do social distancing while distributing food. Um, so I said I would talk a little bit about a couple of the federal policy aspects that have been um, put in place both by Congress and I'll primarily focus on USDA because we have Tom who can tell us a little bit about some of what EPA's response has been. Um, so it, through a couple of the, the uh, packages that Congress has passed, have really put a lot of money and control in the hands of USDA to do some work trying to locate this food that would otherwise be wasted and get it to those who need it. Um, one big one is through TFAP, which is the Emergency Food Assistance Program. So this program exists all the time and it's a primary way that we um, use federal dollars to help support food going to food banks for those who utilize food banks. Um, but across the Families First Act and CARES Act, USDA got a lot of increased funds to use through TFAP. The good news is that that is a, a tried and tested program. The bad news is that it takes quite a while and I think there was early on very much pushback that um, even though the dollars were given to TFAP in, in early, you know, mid-March, we knew that that food wouldn't be purchased and get out to food banks until July. So some of the follow-up programs were the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, which came out of the CARES Act. And one of the key things that USDA is doing under this is doing a program called Farms to Families, which will spend $100 million each month, um, or $100 million each on uh, the vegetables, produce, dairy, and then cooked meat. So 300 million total per month over the next few months to purchase um, from distributors who were able to kind of submit bids to purchase the product from producers and then find methods of distributing them to nonprofit organizations. And I think this is a really great solution and something that people should have on their radars, both if you are a distributor and can somehow be um, actually submitting um, bids on those. I think the first round of those closed, but I think likely we'll see more. Um, as producers to be networking with distributors that are serving your region to find ways to be selling to them so that they're, you're getting into those distribution chains. And then those distributors have a lot of uh, leeway to decide how to distribute those to nonprofits in the region that they're serving. I think for those nonprofits on this, uh, on this call, um, once USDA puts out the list of which distributors will be doing that, getting in touch with the ones that work in your region and talking to them about what your needs are and how you can be a recipient of some of those foods and um, to be getting them out to stakeholders that you're serving. Given all of that, I think it's still not enough. USDA just this week announced that they're also gonna spend an additional $475 million through what's known as Section 32 funding, which is yet another way that USDA purchases food and gets it sent out through food banks. Um, and if I had to guess, I would say we'll see more of that. But I think that's been a really a great response. It's just been a little bit slow to start. And I think also um, just the scale of the amount of food that there is right now and the amount of people in need are going to mean that more solutions are needed. The other big federal um, uh, funding mechanism is through FEMA. And I'll say a little bit about it. We could talk more about it. But what I've heard mostly from communities is that it's a little bit tricky um, because the guidance that FEMA puts out is, is 
it's a little bit unclear how communities will know whether they're able to access these dollars. But in theory, there's money through FEMA that states or localities could utilize to um, cover provision of food to people who are in need. Um, and I know one great example is California already is using that money to pay restaurants to serve home delivered meals to people, primarily elderly and others who are in need of food but aren't on some other food assistance program. And that is gonna be paid for with FEMA dollars. Um, states and localities have to pay a 25% match to access those. And again, there's not some like, unlike the USDA programs that have a, a cutoff date where you apply and it's pretty clear whether you got that funding or not, I think the challenge that we've heard is that there's a little bit of uh, lack of clarity as to whether um, you start this program, like will FEMA come in and pay for it in the end? But I do think that they've been clear that there is money on the table to do that. Um, and they were given additional money through CARES Act. Um, the, the last thing to mention is that there's been some flexibility that's worth noting for those who are really trying to find food and get it redistributed um, that FDA has put in place in particular to say, we know that there's certain food that was stuck in a supply chain that was meant for commercial use, but if you want to now sell that at retail, we're going to make it easier to do that. So as one example, typically food sold at retail needs to have a nutrition facts panel on it, and FDA has put out this waiver right now to say, if you're selling some food product that you know was going to be sold in a restaurant or at a concert venue that typically wouldn't have a nutrition facts panel, you actually can get a waiver right now to sell those in retail, make it easier to make sure that that food isn't wasted. Um, in terms of what's needed, I think a couple things, just I'll say a couple things that I think from the policy side and then a couple ways that you all could engage. Um, one thing is, like I said, I think more money is going to be needed. And I think that what we'll see in the next stimulus that Congress is working on is that in addition to maybe building on some of these things, there's been a huge push to send dollars to states and localities. Uh, there's a bunch of different proposals out there of what that would look like. But um, suffice it to say, I think it's likely that we'll see some money specifically flying to states and localities to be doing some of this uh, purchasing of food and getting it to people in need. Um, so I think if those are, if that's something that would support the work you're doing, getting in touch with um, your uh, representatives in Congress, but also working with state and local government to help them make a strong case for what they would do with those funds and why it's needed. Um, to me, the other benefit of that is that I think what may be overlooked in some of these federal programs are really small farmers. And we've seen already that uh, small farmers, for example, farmers who sell direct to consumers uh, have already, I think, lost over a billion dollars worth of sales because a lot of the avenues that they sell have closed off. So to me, one of the benefits of some of the dollars going to state and local government is that potentially they could really target smaller producers who aren't selling through these larger USDA programs. Um, the other things I think just when we think about some of the reasons that food is being wasted, we're looking at um, expansion of liability protections for food donations. So this is something we've worked on for a while, but in particular, um, as a lot of food recovery organizations are trying to shift to do more delivery of food, a, a new cost is increased transportation. And so we're looking at both expanding liability protection so that if you were to give people donated food but charge a dollar for delivery, and food recovery organizations could make that math work a little bit better. Um, and then we're also looking at some tax opportunities that would help better cover transportation. So um, for, for food recovery organizations, for logistics companies, whoever's stepping up to do more transportation of food, finding ways to reimburse that either upfront with funding like some of the ones I mentioned or through um, some tax benefit that goes to cover the, the transportation. So those are a couple ideas. Um, I can talk about others, um, but I think the main things just to keep in mind is that there is a shifting landscape. I think checking out these websites, I've been impressed actually as to USDA and FDA um, that they're pretty quickly kind of updating some of the guidance and waiver information. So I think keeping a finger on the pulse by seeing what's going on and what opportunities there are to apply for funding or to use some of these like labeling flexibilities that I mentioned. Um, I think also connecting with state and local government and finding ways to make yourself available and to be part of um, their plea for some federal funding, which hopefully then could go to make some of these connections between farmers and food producers who aren't finding a market right now and the many people that are in need. So I'll leave it there. I know we'll have more to discuss um, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Emily. Appreciate starting with that 
that great overview of kind of everything you're seeing and, and expect to see. Uh, Tom, we'll go to you. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. It's great to be here today. And uh, it's great to be on a panel with Emily and Elizabeth. Um, what I'd like to talk about for a few minutes in this introductory phase is some tools and resources that EPA has available for people who are out there in the audience to uh, get more fully in, in, in the amount of food loss and waste in the country. So hey, just Tom, like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm briefly, you know, you quickly, I've been... Just, oh, yeah, we had a little bit of audio interference, if you don't mind maybe trying to uh, adjust your position with the microphone really quick. It sounded better there at the end, so I think you're good to go. Okay, does it sound a little better? Should I be closer? Yes, that's great. Perfect. Okay, yeah, because it's like a difference of about that much. Okay, so um, <laughs> yeah, I hope this I hope this work, works out okay. Um, you know, we've been um, involved in, in issues regarding food loss and waste now for like 10 years, maybe a little bit more agency. In early days, when we were all learning about this and understanding programs. Our first one, which is developed in very hierarchy, you may know, is like an upside down triangle that I guess most of the people are familiar with. That became kind of an unofficial logo of, um, of our program that helped people to understand the priority in terms of benefits of managing food loss and waste in accordance with preventing and then feeding needy people and feeding animals and industrial uses and encompass what people are doing. We worked to get that program since that hey, point Tom. In time. Yes. Sorry, Tom, if we can just interrupt quickly, I'm going to maybe ask if we can go to Elizabeth and have Nathan call you really quick to try and switch to your phone audio just so we can okay. hear you a little okay. bit better. We're having a bit of interference. Okay, thank you. So let's go ahead and do, yeah, not a problem. Um, Elizabeth, if we can go ahead and go to you just while we sort that out, and then we'll, Tom will come back to you in just a minute. Absolutely. Um, great. Well, thanks, um, Refed, for inviting me to be here and um, for all of you on the call. Um, I'm really delighted that um, you're interested in this topic. I can absolutely share, uh, pick up kind of where Emily um, left off. I were, um, you know, obviously sort of skipping middle level and going kind of right down to the city level. Um, and we can obviously transition back to that uh, and get some more information from Tom. But um, NRDC has been working with cities um, through the Food Matters Project for about five years. And um, most recently, we sort of wrapped up a two-year engagement where we were working very closely with Denver and Baltimore. And then through the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, um, had the chance to work with about 40, over 40 cities nationwide um, through that sort of member city network. Um, and I think what we've seen as far as the response to COVID at the city level um, is that the sort of soft infrastructure that we've created through our work, um, you know, working not just with city officials and policymakers, but also um, on the ground, local organizations doing all kinds of food systems work from food rescue to um, food scrap recycling uh, and other sort of broad, you know, broad community organizations is that um, by working with them directly the last couple of years and really connecting the dots between city government um, and sort of city led initiatives and these local partners um, and the communities and the businesses that um, are part of those cities is we have this sort of um, really incredible network and web of people who have been become in constant contact. And part of it is even just a diversification of partners working together within city government. So um, because city, because food waste and food issues um, sits in multiple departments within a city, we've, we, our work has depended upon really critical relationships and contacts um, across city agencies, everyone from, you know, the sanitation department to health, um, business, you know, either sort of Department of Commerce or Small Business Services, um, just to name a few, Economic Development, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Um, so now that we're in a crisis mode and the issue includes food waste, I mean, I think the, the sort of food relevant um, nature of the crisis um, certainly has a food, a big food waste component, but is broader than just food waste. We're finding that cities have um, 
found the ones that we've worked with are, are finding themselves able to more nimbly sort of respond to the crisis. So um, they have relationships in place with local food bank um, operations, operators, and, um, you know, uh, we're seeing compost drop-off sites that are being repurposed for food distribution. Um, we do a lot of work in schools, and we have done in the last couple of years through our city's work, and schools are being, obviously, they're an importantly critical um, sort of frontline organization right now for getting food, not just the children in need, but um, but a lot of community members. So I, I think our main takeaway is that, um, you know, in times of not, like, not in crisis, you are developing plans and policies and programs um, to further this food waste work at the city level. Um, but what we found is that those kinds of connections and partnerships uh, have become very meaningful and have enabled cities to really, um, you know, very rapidly, very effectively um, coordinate across city agencies, coordinate in a public-private partnership manner. Um, and I think having worked in city government, I can say that, you know, part of the challenge for city response is just overcoming that initial sort of bureaucratic hurdle of like, who do I need to talk to? You know, who do I need to loop in? Um, what are the key, what's the key information I need to get here? Um, unlike a business, or maybe like some businesses, but in a way that's different than um, than a for-profit, you know, entity, um, public sector, you know, move slowly and have to have, they have a, just an enormously um, complicated sort of due diligence process. So for our cities, being able to kind of cut through a lot of that initial red tape has been really critical. Um, I will also say that we are seeing through our city's work as well as, you know, conversations more broadly um, with city partners um, and NRDC works a lot with cities. Apart from food waste, uh, we have initiatives on, um, you know, we have our American Cities Climate Challenge and we're working, so we're working on a number of um, focused areas with cities all over the country. Um, and I think what we're seeing too is that, uh, so, so there are a lot of new sort of um, resources that we're finding are emerging. Um, I'm happy to, I'll put in the chat window some of um, both our resources at the city level and then what we've seen from other cities. I'll touch on just a couple um, here and then we can get into them in um, more detail uh, during this call or if folks are interested, certainly can reach out to me um, by email. But um, one of the specific things we've seen is, um, so New York City developed a, a food donation portal and they, re they launched it um, about a year ago, a little less than a year ago. Um, I, having worked in at the Department of Sanitation, I know that the folks there um, are very open to making their code um, available to other cities. So if you're a city and you're thinking like, oh, well, now would be a great time to have a food donation portal, we don't have a year to develop it. Um, I would definitely say you could, you know, you, you should consider reaching out to the Department of Sanitation and seeing if you can get that code. Um, it may be one tool that could help um, your city or the city that you, where you operate, um, sort of effectively get something in place. Um, the other thing, the other resource that, um, again, is not our own, but it recently came across my desk, and I think it's worth um, taking a look at, is the San Diego Food System Alliance um, released a sort of uh, memo and issue brief that outlines sort of immediate impacts and priority recommendations for policymakers and funders. Um, so this is something that if you're a policymaker can really help you um, focus in on uh, ordering your priorities and also can be a tool for communicating with funders. Um, if you're a funder, this is something that can help you get a sense of um, what city folks are facing on the ground and where, um, where best to kind of concentrate your efforts and, um, and your funding capabilities. Um, so that's another great resource. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, as, an, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have been working with the USDN um, for about almost two years now. And one of the initiatives that's come out of that partnership is a food waste working group. Um, so the USDN has 200 member cities across the country and, and also focuses on a number of um, sort of urban sustainability issues, uh, everything from transport to green buildings, um, 
and waste. And we've we about a year and a half ago we um, launched a food waste working group where we get about you know anywhere from sort of 30 to 50 cities every call. We have a monthly call, um, and we really dig in on specific issues that are the most relevant to cities. The um, by and large, the topics and the um, the sort of solutions that we bring to the discussion are those that the cities identify as being the most salient and the most pertinent to them. Um, so I would say if anybody on this call is a USDN member city um, and you're not already part of this working group, um, I can definitely give you, you can private chat me and I can give you information um, about how to get connected. They are having a call, actually the monthly call is tomorrow um, at 2 p.m. Eastern that is going to specifically focus on um, sort of COVID food waste response um, at the city level. So. Again, USDN is um, a really tremendous resource that I think, um, whether you're a city or not, uh, it's definitely worth uh, taking a look at. Great, I'll thank leave you, there. Elizabeth. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm sure we'll come back with some questions in a minute. And speaking of questions, just a reminder to be sending questions through the chat to Angel, uh, and we'll be asking those here in just a second. Um, Tom, with fingers crossed, we are coming back to you. Let's see if your audio is, is working this time. Oh, try unmuting on your phone, Tom. How's that? That is perfect. Yay. You sure it's still okay? It's still okay. I'll I'll let you know. Okay. Don't worry. Okay, good. No surprises. Thank you. I'm sorry we had that little bit of flub. Uh, maybe it was best that I went last because what I want to talk about today in these few minutes of our introduction before we get into Q&A is some of the tools and resources that EPA has available to everyone out there, every, all the listeners and everyone, to try to find new ways to continue to reduce the amount of food loss and waste in the country, which you all know is enormous. EPA got initially involved in this aspect of, um, of environmental issues because of uh, recognition of all the food that was going into landfills. And that was about, I mean, I've been in this program for about 10 years and it was alive and well at that time. And one of the early responses was to develop uh, a hierarchy of methodologies or, or uh, uh, a tier system in order to kind of guide the optimal methods to reduce food waste. And of course, reducing it in the first place is the best option and then feeding needy people and feeding animals and industrial uses and composting kind of lined up on an upside down triangle with landfills, that little small piece at the bottom, which unfortunately still receives so much food waste. So we developed um, uh, these programs for that purpose and they've evolved. And even the name of the program evolved from when I first started. Now we, we, um, we call our program Sustainable Management of um, Food. And the reason for that, at least as I understand it best, is to try to set an early foundation to help people understand that we're really trying to help implement a systematic approach to food waste reduction in the, in the way we do best, which is by creating tools and resources and assets and interacting with the public and interacting with, with you folks. So we, you know, we look at uh, at food waste related issues from from farms to distribution methods to processors and manufacturers and the sales and retail and ultimately to the consumer and try to um, evaluate and understand food loss along that cycle and then find ways to uh, keep a, as much of that food. Uh, in places where it was originally designed to go, which was mostly for, for people to eat. Um, so in order to do that, you know, we have these, these tools, and I, I thought for the purpose of this discussion, I kind of separate them into three bins. And the, the reason for this is, you know, really my purpose here is to try to provide information that would encourage uh, you folks and others to try to engage with us. And that's because we are, think of us as a provider of resources and tools to you to help you achieve whatever goals you have, uh, reducing food waste at wherever your touch point is, whether you're interacting with farmers or you're interacting with consumers, wherever that touch point is, we, we kind of sit here and stand here and are available to help you out. So the first bin I want to describe is what I think of as like the passive. It's kind of like a passive um, set of resources and tools that, that exist on our website. And I'll make sure Nathan has the right link for you, but uh, basically it's epa.gov backslash sustainable-management-food. So everything I refer to 
and much, much more is on that site for you. So the, the bins I'm referring to provide a set of tools that um, I'll give you a few examples that some people out there uh, might want to know, for example, if they engage in certain food waste diversion practices, composting, anaerobic digestion, prevention, how much uh, would that accomplish in terms of greenhouse gas reductions? You know, what's the, what's the climate change positive impacts of different option, options and alternatives? Well, we have a model on the, our website called WARM, W-A-R-M, or Wasted, um, uh, Wasted Reduction Model. Uh, we refer to it as WARM, which allows you to go in there interactively and work with a spreadsheet. And we're, the, we have, we're happy to help you, of course, and find out uh, what the greenhouse gas reductions are of your, um, your particular programs. So another tool that um, links a lot into what Elizabeth was saying, we have a tool that helps guide people on how to do a, a food waste audit of their facilities. It could be a commercial kitchen or it could be a K through 12 school. And it's, it's a set of guidelines that kind of walks you through the process, helps you understand how to collect the data, and then that helps you understand how to interpret the data and then ultimately gives you the real, the real goal is to find ways to, and suggestions on how to reduce food waste in, in, in K-12 schools. It might be composting, it might be setting up share tables. Uh, we have a pretty extensive resource of a variety of information from municipalities and governments that wanna find ways to transform their food. And this links again a lot with what Elizabeth was saying about municipalities. So it's a link in there, it's a link about transforming food. And there's gotta be 100 to 200 different resources that planners and other folks can use to try to get some information and get some, uh, some suggestions on how to develop ideas for their own particular, their needs. Over the years, we've uh, had a lot of webinars like this. And uh, we've recorded all of those webinars and they're available back at least several years on our website. And they cover a lot of different topics uh, related to food waste reduction, K through 12 schools. And I, I would encourage people that trying to get some background information on programs they're interested in to go and look at some of the old webinars and sit back over a cup of coffee and review them. The last thing I, I wanna mention in terms of tools is a fairly new tool, it's got a long title. It's called the Excess Food Opportunities Mapping Tool. And this is really dynamo. It was managed and started and you know, launched from headquarters and Claudia Fabiano has really led that. And basically what it allows you to do is if you ask a question in your community and you say, geez, how much food is being wasted in our community? And you'd like to get an estimate of that, that tool will tell you how to do it. It's an interactive tool. You can go in there and you can sort it by congressional district or a county or state and you can uh, sort it by sector, for example, wholesalers or retailers or restaurants or case through 12 schools or institutions are listed in the county, let's say a county where you're sitting, um, by the name of the organization and an estimate that we make a low and high estimate about the amount of surplus food that each one, to those, one of those entities might generate. So you can imagine as a first estimate of trying to figure out what those surplus food or excess food resources are in a community, you can get it in like no time flat. Honestly, 30 minutes, you could probably cover all the sectors, maybe an hour in, in your community and have that really rock solid information to start planning your recovery programs. Um, so the, uh, the next thing I wanna mention is for, it's more of a program, but I have a bin for it. It's called our Food Recovery Challenge. And this is a, this is a, a program that allows organizations to join in a community of, of groups that are interested in reducing their food waste and uh, food losses and to set goals for the programs and projects they'd like to undertake in a given year. And then to do and work with us if they'd like and work along the lines that they're trying to project to reduce their food waste. And then at the end of the year, they actually record their progress. And uh, these are called participants because those are folks that actually manage surplus food or food waste. So they're entering data in our, in our uh, food recovery challenge program. And at the end of the year, uh, we look through that. Of course, we've interacted with all those people as we go along. And we issue a regional and national awards for folks that have accomplished and exceeded their, um, their food waste goals. And in some cases, it's more of a narrative goal. Some cases, it's a data-driven goal. But regardless, it gives us an opportunity to interact with organizations and actually present awards uh, to them for their, all of their accomplishments. And in fact, I think just last week, we announced the awards for the previous year, which is like 2018, Roy's one year behind. That program also, has groups that are called endorsers. And these are organizations that don't actually directly manage food, 
but they're involved in it in a significant way. And they joined the Food Recovery Challenge as a way of uh, conducting outreach and education programs on behalf of food loss and waste, and uh, also in some cases encouraging some of their contacts to join the Food Recovery Challenge. So um, that's the essence of that program, and it's been around for several years, and it's, it's just great. The, the third um, bin I wanted to wait uh, here until last because it's the one that's most, uh, I think, most effective overall, and it's most appealing to me, and it's the one that I really want to emphasize today because it's the one that has to do with us interacting with you. So that third bin is like you guys reaching out to us and using us as a resource to try to help you in whatever aspect of food loss and waste you might need some advice about or you might um, want some suggestions on how to proceed with something or you want to have an, inter an interactive discussion in some way. It's our way of really touching you. And it's, it's, the, um, it's the methodology I would encourage you to take if you want to increase your um, your activities in, in the food loss and waste space and to use us. And it's really just email us or make a phone call. On the website that I mentioned, we have a list of contacts. There's 10 EPA regions around the country. And each region has staff people like me that are uh, involved in this program and working with you in, in different ways and, and different levels. And you can find that contact list on that website with the name of the person responsible in each region and their email and phone number. So in region three, I'm talking to you outside of Philadelphia, Luke Wolfgang, is, uh, is our main contact. So that's the way to, um, to get at us and to get us connected and engaged with you. I want to um, read you one quick thing that Virginia Till in Denver sent me about this because I think it articulates why I'm saving this, this uh, bin, so to speak, this way of interacting with us until last. So, and this, this is the way I feel too. So Virginia says, I see my role as a connector, sometimes even a catalyst. I connect people with people and with information. In our role at EPA, staff have such a wide range of knowledge about EPA programs, other federal programs, networks, contacts, and community efforts that we can provide many ideas and connections much more easily and efficiently than you would get by doing a Google search. So she says, take advantage of all that we have to offer. Um, so beyond that, we can go to Q&A. What I do have is uh, at some point, I hope I can, um, provide them in this, in this hour, half hour we have left. I have some very specific examples of some of the interactions that have taken place in the last 30 days with people that have called and contacted us and asked us to help them. In some cases, very specifically to this COVID situation that we're in right now where there's so much surplus food. So I think, Jackie, would you rather me like serve you for Q&A or do you want me to give a couple examples now or how would you like to manage that? Yeah, let me, let me ask a couple of questions really quick and then if we have time at the end here, Tom, we'll come back for some of those specific examples. I think that'd be great. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in just first off around all the resources that have been shared verbally. And let me just point some people to the chat bar where we've linked several of those. Uh, Nathan will also be sending out a, a recap email in the next day where a lot of those resources will also be linked. So anything that's been mentioned, we'll make sure that those get out to the group. Um, one thing to flag, Elizabeth, there is some interest in your call tomorrow. So as that is coming up sooner rather than later, maybe we'll reach out to you sooner to try and get that call and info for people that are interested in joining. Um, a question first for Emily. Um, there are a couple questions around the um, liability protection. One is specific to how organizations on the call can help support the expansion of that. And then very specifically trying to understand what travel reimbursements or grants may be available if that expansion occurs. Um, we do have an organization on the line who has seen an exponential increase in transportation costs. So they're looking to learn a little bit more about what that may cover. That's great. Um, I actually, it's a good moment. We've seen uh, actually just in the last few days some interest about the liability protection pieces. So there's been um, a bill that was pending in Congress, and I think the members in the Senate that we were working with have gotten a lot of interest. So the bill that's written right now, what it would currently do is three main things. One is allow would clarify that there would be protection not only for food that's given away for free, but also food that's sold at a low cost, which is called a Good Samaritan reduced price. And the idea there is really that you're, mm -hmm. it's not going to be a fit for everyone, but that in some cases, especially now, we're seeing that the cost of getting food is, um, is, is really taking a lot of energy on the part of, of organizations doing this. 
So the idea would be that, that their donors wouldn't lose protection, even if there was a small charge. And I think, again, what some of the examples we've seen would be um, the food is free, but if you need home delivery to allow us to deliver to so many people who are in need right now, there'd be a small charge that covers the cost of that and, and still preserving the liability protection. And the other would be allowing protection for direct donations. And the examples of this would be for, uh, we've heard farmers, or a lot of farmers saying, uh, you know, they they prefer to sell their food. That would be great because they need the money. But um, if right now they wanted to just donate um, in the Emerson Act, it says that they're only protected if they give the food to a nonprofit that then gives it to people in need. So this would clarify that if they just gave that away for free, they would have liability protection. And similarly, we've heard that this would be helpful for schools who are doing a lot of still um, giving away meals for students when schools are closed. But at the end of the day, when they have excess food, making it very clear that that can be given away. Um, so those are the main things that it does. The last is that it would also, this would be a little bit longer term, but ask USDA for more guidance. And I think especially if some of the, there are some changes to the protection, having some uh, more guidance longer term would be good. We're actually today drafting a sign on letter. And so I would love um, to be able to share if people want to sign on. Um, I think the best way to do that, maybe I can coordinate with you guys at Refed about if people want to sign on to that, that would be really helpful. I do think we have a moment. I think there's the main thing we've been asked to do is show that there's support behind this. Um, and again, it wouldn't have been anything that's protective right now. It would just add a little bit more flexibilities because I think what we've seen right now is that flexibility is really key. Um, so I think that answered most of your question. I'll leave it there for now. There's some tax pieces we're working on too that are a little further behind, but, um, but I'm happy to also share information about those. Um, and people can feel free to email me and I will, um, mostly it's Ariel Ardura on my team who's handling this stuff with me. So I will promptly send you her way so she can send you more information. Perfect, thanks Emily. Um, another question on here, Elizabeth, I'm gonna take this one to you and Emily, you may wanna chime in a little bit, but um, there's a couple related questions about how regional and state efforts are coordinating with each other like if there's matchmaking you're sharing of best practices between cities and states and emily i thought you might want to chime in to maybe talk a little bit even about the connectivity between more local and federal um if there's a way that those are tying in together but elizabeth let's go ahead and start with you yeah so um i mean obviously i'm a big fan of usdn um so i think another plug like they are a phenomenal uh, platform for cities to be able to not just only get information from like NRDC and other um, outside experts and advisors, but um, I think the very premise of the organization is to connect cities with each other and have a, you know, establish and maintain a platform for um, knowledge sharing and best practice exchange. So um, definitely, I think that's a really tremendous resource. Um, otherwise, I think the reality, at least as we've seen it, is that um, cities do have good relationships with one another, um, but that tends to be ad hoc. Uh, there's not necessarily, um, other than the USDN and some other, there's ICLE, um, there's Conference of Mayors, there's National League of Cities. So there's several city networks um, that can be really useful ways for cities to get in touch with one another. Um, specifically on this issue, but um, but otherwise, I think you know anecdotally we see that uh, you know we, part of our work has been to try to bring more cities together and and forge those connections. Um, so I would definitely say you know feel free to reach out and if there's um, a way that we can put you in touch with someone that that you know or a city that we know would have useful experience to share, um, you know we'd be happy to do so. I'll add just one thing, which I don't know, Jackie, this may not get to the question exactly that you asked, but I think that's worth raising, which is that um, a couple of different cities and states have been have either put out or are working on more comprehensive plans related to food during COVID-19. And I think uh, New York City has had put out a really good one that was feeding New York City. And um, so it's mostly taken from the perspective of people in need of emergency food, but a lot in there also speaks to where that food will come from. And, how to keep those supply chains moving. Um, and I think, I know Massachusetts is working on one. Um, I think there's a couple other, uh, you know, others that are working on things like that. But I think those are also a good way to plug in to your state or local government. The thing I'm seeing right now is that it feels like there's a lot of money available at the federal level. And it's been amazing, like that Congress has been willing to allocate more funds and 
realizing the gravity of the situation and the need. The challenge is that it's hard to really target precisely from the federal level. So I think that my hope is really that there'll be more dialogue between the levels of government so that the funding can be available, but that I think cities and states really, you know, to Elizabeth's point, like they know on the ground where are the gaps, what are the communities that aren't being served right now. I think we've heard even here in Boston that a food pantry that was open last week isn't open this week because people were sick and they closed. So I think, you know, being able to kind of manage that on the ground, but have that support from the federal level. Um, and I think all the people on this call can help kind of bridge that by being another voice for what's needed for the state and local level to really do their job and make sure that farmers and food producers are making money and that people in need are getting fed. Great. Emily, one more quick question for you just while you are unmuted and then Tom, I'll come to you. Um, but there's a question about when the USDA is going to release the distribution channels for farm to families that you mentioned in your opening comment. Do you have visibility to that? Yeah, they, so they, I, I think their first round of applications for that were due, I want to say like maybe last week. Um, and they are hope, they're saying that the first funding, the first like run of it will happen by May 5th, around May 15th. So I think we'll see that happen really soon. Um, again, the way that it worked was really that distributors could apply to USDA and say, here's what I can provide of these three foods you're interested in. So produce, dairy, and cooked meat. Here's the region that I can serve. And then the distributors are going to have a lot of flexibility to choose the nonprofits that they're going to give that food to. And I imagine that that, isn't, that piece won't be set in stone and may change over time. So I think there's, um, that, you know, if you are either trying to sell or provide food and want to connect with like distributors that serve your region, or if you're in need of food and want to get it on the other end, I imagine that they'll, they'll put out a list of who received those funding for which regions. I just don't know the exact timing on that. But I'm happy if I Great. come Thank across you, my Mike. desk, I'll share to refed to send out to everyone. Thank you. Um, Tom, let's do go to you. Um, we only have a couple minutes left for here, here for Q&A, but there is some interest in hearing more about some of the very specific ways that people have been or people ways you want to see people engaging with EPA uh, in your third bucket, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. So I'll give you a couple of examples because um, what I want to try to illustrate is that and to encourage people to be very comfortable contacting us with any questions they have, whether it's uh, seemingly what some people might think is like a little issue or or people that have a much more a larger issue. And I'll give you an example of um, something that we've accomplished uh, just in the last month and a half with our, our partners in the gleaning sector, the so farm gleaning sector. And uh, we've been able to work with a, a, a call that uh, recently that came in. I mean, I'm talking like end of February, March, from an organization that has a technology platform that connects local farmers to buyers. And that mission was exactly as it says, to try to enhance the sales opportunities for local farms to sell uh, food into local communities and thereby become more financially sustainable. We've been able um, to expand that local farm buyer connection to gleaners. The reason is gleaners have access to a lot of farmers and a lot of farmers with surplus call gleaners and say, here, I've got this food, I've harvested it, I can't sell it, you can have it and give it to hunger relief. That's kind of the normal pathway that things have been going for a long time. Well, now not only do we have a way to truncate that, but we also have a way to try to deliver more of this excess that's becoming available. And that is um, by going, having gleaners actually become a sales channel for farmers. So if you, if you can capture this idea, local farmer has surplus apples, uh, uh, potatoes, things like that. They call it his gleaner and uh, they say, look, if you can sell some of this produce, that would be great to give the rest to hunger relief. What we've done is we've accomplished that and we've uh, and, you know, facilitated that accomplishment. It's not us obviously directly, but we've facilitated making the connections so that that process is now occurring. So farm food, this, and, and Emily mentioned this too, that would be targeted to hunger relief. Some portion of that is now able to be sold, um, staying in the food chain. That's one example. Here's another example that came in just the other day from um, the Surf Better program of US Foods that uh, is recognizing they've got this vast volume of surplus food that they is beyond the capacity to deliver. And so they were thinking about, uh, does it make sense to try to supply that surplus to local commercial kitchens? And in this case, so the Feeding America affiliate um, and possibly in our area and possibly increase preparation of meals from 2,000 a week up to 10,000 plus a week just to take advantage of this uh, surplus 
food. Um, I've got some more, but I'm a little bit, let me give you a little one, because this will give a sense of people that think that they have a small little issue, and maybe they'd be a little nervous about asking or whatever. We had a call to a Kim in our Atlanta office from a, 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 a lady in, in Florida who was concerned about pets, and she was seeing a lot of, as a result of COVID, a lot of pets were being abandoned, being picked up by the shelter, and she called to ask if there's a way that she could tap into surplus food from grocery stores that was being accessed because of this COVID situation and, and other sources to get that into and pet food recovery. So that might seem like a little thing, but it's all, you know, it could be U.S. foods or it could be a, a single person calling about a particular problem. It's very important and very heartfelt to them where, where surplus food can be part of the solution. So we've got a lot of other things like that. The point I want to make is, is that we're doing a whole lot of things by making the connections and facilitating um, uh, our networks to try to bring more resources to bear on these very important problems. The last Thanks. thing. Really, Thank you so much. Me, oh, sorry, Tom. <laughs> give, me, give me one minute. Uh, so this peak that we have in surplus food as a result of COVID has everybody kind of stunned and shocked and New York Times articles and a lo whole lot of activity is occurring right now to try to capture and try to avoid losing all of this food. But this COVID timeframe is gonna, is gonna end hopefully sooner rather than later. But the projections that, that I'm seeing now and others are seeing that look at this indicate that unemployment is gonna ramp very slowly. It's not gonna go back to the way it was. We're not gonna have 3.5% unemployment. By the end of 2020, we're gonna have 6.5% or 6.2% unemployment. So if you can imagine linking food insecurity to unemployment, which is a direct linkage, we really have to do more. And what I'm hoping people can do, whatever you're out there doing and you're focusing so much on upping your, upping your game and upping your program to capture this excess food during the COVID period, think about after the COVID transition ends and you're moving into a longer term, set a goal. Say maybe let's see if we, now that we're doing so much more, working real hard and all that, that maybe in this reducing back off the the COVID uh, uh, chaos, we could maintain and up, up our game enough to maybe do 150% of what we were doing before. So that's my pitch on that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thanks for adding that in. That's a, a great point. Um, well, thank you to all our panelists. We are about at time here. Time flies when we're having fun. And there are a lot of questions about resources we're continuing to get in. So just to reiterate, we will send out um, links to all those that are available that the panelists mentioned today. And if there's questions, we're happy to facilitate connections as well. So this is certainly not the end of the conversation. Um, as we are wrapping up, there's going to be a link to a survey coming through the chat bar. If people can just take a second to click on that before you sign off, we would appreciate any of your feedback, as well as you can contribute questions and comments through there that we can also share with our panelists that we didn't get to today. Um, and we'll have a written recap and recording available in the next few days. And you can join us next week, same time on Wednesday, uh, for the final installment of at least the series to date. And that, this is on organizational financial health during and after COVID-19. So, Tom, you had a perfect segue with your last comment there into. Thanks. Uh, thank you for Great. that. Um, so, yeah, please look at our website and for a recap email coming. Thought of what has been shared by panelists today. And just a big thank you to our panelists and all those who participated and hope that everyone has a great day. Thank you.